Welcome to Teague Talks, the hospitality-centered podcast that dives deep into the stories of industry leaders to give you the very best in hotel market insights, investment, and inspiration. I'm your host, Teague Hunter. Today, we're talking with Ryan Rivet, president and CEO of My Place Hotels, who talks about growing up in South Dakota, franchising today, and how he's continuing his grandfather, Ron Rivet's legacy, founder of Super 8. Ryan Rivet, how are you, sir? Thanks for joining me today. I'm good, Teague. I'm glad to be on here with you. I know. It's a first time, right? This is going to be fun. Uh, yeah. This is going to be exciting. Uh, where I got to know, where are you today? Uh, I'm in my office here in Aberdeen, South Dakota. That's, you, I, I'm wondering, that might be our first South Dakota. It's uh, it's kind of like the, the, the hotel central of the world here. We've got so many hoteliers in this town and so much that relates to it. You can't get away from it. So I'm I'm happy to live here, though. It's a great place to live, especially when it's 40 degrees in January, which doesn't happen very often. What? So it's a beautiful day here right now. That's 40 degrees in Florida right now. Yeah, real fast. Who are the people? Thurlton was up there. Name me all the other people. Um, yeah, Thurlton's out of North Dakota, but only about 90 miles from here. Yep. Uh, you've got uh, Keeler organizations out of here. You've got uh, Super 8, of course, came in yep. and our group below it. And then there's a... I think a half a dozen different groups, um, the Quest Development Group, and and handful of others that come out of Aberdeen, but a lot of ties beyond that to different groups that are based out of elsewhere, but have uh, equity partners and and working partners that are either from or still live here. So it's a good place. Yeah, to be. you're right. Is it, there's a an inordinate amount of hoteliers uh, yeah. out in that part of the world. So and you guys are one of them. All right, so let's get into this. Here's what here's what I'm going. To, I want to. It's personalization of all the stuff that we do, right? So. Uh, that's what makes our industry great. It's the stories behind the people. So yeah. um, I, we want to know as much as anything. Yeah, we'll get into the my place and we'll get into the company and all that. But I want to know, the people want to know, who is Ryan Rivet? How did you get into this space? What's your first job? How did you get into this? Uh, much less start a brand. We'll go there. But uh, give us the Ryan Rivet origin story, please. I was... That's um, a great one, by the way. It's I know, it's a great one. So, so, so I'm... Um, the oldest grandchild in my family and uh, my grandfather started in business in 1974 and um, had three daughters. And when I came along, he kind of grabbed me and said, I'm going to do something with this kid. And so he drug me along really uh, close, closely to him. And I think it was kind of predetermined that I was going to be in the business somehow or another. And so that my earliest memories surrounding, uh, well, my earliest memories, in fact, surround different things that had elements of business laced into them. You hear every family, every, every generational business or every family who's in business talk about, you know, dinner table talk was all business. It was all about the hotel business. It was all about the next piece of land or, or, you know, this group or that group. And that's really how it was for me. Um, and just growing up in that, I, I learned to, to key in on different things that the older people at the table were talking about that really piqued my interest. So and growing up, I didn't know what form I was going to be in business. I just knew for sure I was going to be in business. So I struggled through school and uh, college and only for really for one purpose, which was to get that part over with so I could get into this part. And um, first job, you know, I, I got put to work pretty quickly in the summers working uh, on our fishing lodge in Alaska. And that was that was the intro to the hospitality experience. It was not glamorous at all. I can tell you that much, but I learned how to clean fish. I learned how to take out garbage. I learned how to clean up the dishes after the groups that were in and, and cart luggage around. So it, although it wasn't the traditional hotel, it was all the same things that you might find uh, the young, the young uh, bellman or room attendant or kitchen attendant, which of which I was all of those things doing. So I think fish was, lodge. I think you're the first fishing lodge story we've got. I've got a lot of fishing lodge stories. We're still in that business today. And uh, uh, today I'm a customer, though. I don't work out there. So granddad was the mentor, right? We've heard that a lot. You need the mentor. So that was granddad, right? So remind us who granddad was and what granddad did. So um, my grandfather, Ron Rivet, started, um, uh, he and another fellow from Aberdeen founded Super 8 Motels here in 1974. So they 
neither one of them were in the hotel business uh, other than uh, uh, Dennis, his partner had decided he was going to start a marketing cooperative for local hoteliers that didn't work out very well and wasn't working. And so the idea was inserted that, why don't we build one? Um, well, the, we wasn't really a, we yet. And, and that's when Ron entered the, the picture and said, well, I've built a few houses and a few duplexes. How, how much harder can a hotel be? He was selling insurance at the time and, uh, had been a banker in the trust department prior to that. And so they set about trying to put some equity together and get a loan and do the first deal. And it took them about a year to get that done. And they built the first one. Um, and, and that turned into 20 years of, uh, of operating and building the Super 8 franchise brand from here in our offices in, in Aberdeen. What do you think they learned from that Super 8 process? I mean, about financing or about how to run a franchise? I mean, just growth too, right? Like that's not, that's complicated stuff. It, it was, I, I think, I think the biggest lessons that were to be learned there from those of us surrounding it and, and adjacent to it, not involved at that time, were the relationship building elements of it. If there's something that you could point to as a catalyst for the growth of Super 8, it was all of the partnerships that were established to create that growth. It wasn't just, hey, we got one big private equity group coming in and you know funding a bunch of development. And it wasn't just a bunch of individual people. It was the dichotomy of, well, we established partnerships in here in Aberdeen. My, my grandfather was notorious for being a partnership guy and and a delegator and i think that's that's a, an area we should come back to later because it's kind of interesting about how delegation works for people but anyway I, I think the lesson you learn is how to build relationship it, it's it's how very important people are to the process and that and and it may not be able to be measured in dollars and cents but the outcome is generally very valuable in dollars and cents so remind me how many super rates did they build so from uh, 1973 or 74, when they opened the first property to 1993, when uh, he sold the chain to HFS, uh, they were just shy of 1,100 properties in the chain in 93 at the time of the sale with a pipeline of about 400 still going. Um, there was 127, I think, corporately owned Super 8 properties, which stayed with us and continued to be managed for a while after the fact. And uh, um, so it was a it was a great it was a great transaction for the time, but an amazing period of growth to, to, to execute a thousand franchises in right at 20 years, especially in the economic circumstances within the eighties, some good, some really challenging. You talk about, you know, 20 plus percent interest rates on new developments and things like that. We have no idea how to, how to comprehend that and what we're doing today. Remind me why the name, how they come up with the name super eight. I have my answer, but why? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of it had to do with, how they well, who they were competing with and they looked at it and said well we got motel six out there and we we want them to be on the bottom end of where we're at um and we think we're a lot better than them and so you know we're going to be super eight instead of motel eight and and there's a lot of other stories and god only knows who has the truthful story about how they came up with it but uh their opening initial rates were eight dollars and 88 cents and that was based on when they got finished building the hotel how much money they needed to rent enough rooms to pay the loan payment. And that was, that was the simple math in the pro forma was just, where do we set the rate to make sure we can make the loan payment? Is it a fascinating time? And, and if I can pile on motel six was $6 uh, days in was $7, seven days in $7, super yep. eight became $8, eight eighty eight. Yep. That was, that was it. It was, it was pure marketing from my perspective. I think, you know, they, they lined all three things up and said, we're going to be a little better than super eight or than motel six. And we're going to have an $8 rate. And it, we think that's super. So there you go. Uh, so when did you start my place? So we started my place in 2012. Um, we built the first property in 2012 and, and the concept was, was kind of similar foundationally. It was, Hey, we're, we're franchisees of most of the major brands today we're developing, owning, operating the infrastructure in our company today is a is is a scaled down version of what it was underneath Super 8. We're vertically integrated. Um, we we really consider ourselves hoteliers and hotel operators at at our core. Um, and and the other elements of it come along as a means to an end. And so we looked at that and said, we know how to do this business and and we think we could be doing it better than what we're subject to in many cases. 
we have the wherewithal to go about it. Let's give it a shot. And, and that's, that's pretty much the way that it went. We built the first one. Hey, it looks good. Let's build number two and three. Like those two, four and five came along and that was in the first 24 months. We did five of them and then said, well, Hey, it's working. Let's start selling some franchises. So that's, that's when we, we brought, uh, Terry Klein back on board from the old super eight days and started selling some franchises. So, uh, so I love it. Back me up though. So what did we do from 93, 1993 to 2012? Well, yeah. So, <laughs> so through, through various partnerships after the sale of super eight, we continued to develop some super eights in the initial years. Of course, we had the portfolio of wholly owned properties that we continued to manage. Um, and so over that 20 year period of time through again, various partnerships, we uh, developed around 80 different properties in of I IHG, Hilton, Marriott, Choice, et cetera. Um, just really as a as a as an integrated developer, builder, and operator yeah. investor in the hotel industry, and and had great success with that. Developed some really great partnerships, and and continued some really great partnerships that continue to exist today in the business, um, and and did really well. So transitioning out of that and into the focus on my place was just sort of the next phase. It really wasn't a, a departure from or, or anything else. We still continue to be in a lot of those partnerships today. Yeah. Do you still own the other hotels? Most we've gotten out of or, or sold over time. And that's, you know, programmatically you end up holding on to them for three, five, seven, and then they turn over. Um, but uh, <clears throat> we still have a few of those legacy assets since before Super Eight or before my place, and uh, most of that though we've we've turned over and repurposed into developing the chain that we're focused on now. We have the first Super Eight motel here in Aberdeen. We still own and operate that as a Super Eight, and uh, as far as as far as we're concerned, it'll be a Super Eight until there's none of our family left, at least. So pretty cool. That's that's the family spirit. I love it. So yeah. I'm on my place. Why did why did we start my place? How much of it was the segment like? And we see this segment. I'll let you define sort of the segment where my place is. And how much was? No, no, we need it. We had success with franchising. Let's go do that again. It's not that hard. Let's go do that again. Because I well, think franchising is impossible. But go ahead. I think that the the segment was was the catalyst. Right. We were we were everybody was beginning to focus on extended stay in a real way at that point in time. It represented what, seven or 8% of the supply in right. the U S right. We were building, you know, other branded extended stay properties, finding that we were generally spending too much to do so. And I think that really was the next step of it was how do we, how do we curate a pro forma, uh, and, and, a, and a, and a product that allows us to get back to the old days of, you know, 50% NOI margins and things. And, and that really spun into, okay, what is, what does that extended stay product look like for us? And, and that's what I said about, um, trying to, trying to put together. And, and that's what we came out with, with super eight is, is a smaller box, um, shorter time to market, uh, smaller individual, um, uh, capital outlay to do it, spreading the risk a little bit farther and, and a good downside protection in the, in the, you know, downward trending cycle period. So all of those things were, were components of it. They're not, complicated to figure out but what is complicated is franchising and that that one is uh that one is definitely a challenge but but i think you know we've we've uh we've been pretty successful with it in spite of the fact that if you'd asked me 10 years ago i thought we would have been farther along today than we are i'm actually kind of happy that we're not because we are so much better prepared today for where we are at than where we would have been five years ago wait so, so what back it up what made you say why not just go build these hey we got a pretty good mousetrap here with this product that we've made pretty efficient why not just go build a bunch of those yourselves why take that step to franchise we we like we like partnerships we like the element yeah. of in, incorporating people into what we're doing that's their strength in numbers and i think fundamentally that's it there may be a little bit of ego laced into it where you say, Hey, I'm not really good at it until I can teach it. And so you kind of throw that, that element in the mix and challenge yourself with how do I teach people to reorient themselves to this product and this method. Um, but it, it, more so than anything, it's, I want to see as many of these out there as we can get. And the only way we're going to do that is through incorporating the franchise element into it and going out and grinding through putting the, the network together. What's the trickiest part of franchising? Oh man, um, I'd say it's it's probably transitioning from 
what someone's perception is to the reality of it. You know, you have those people that first jump in, they're they're early adopters, they love it, they're rah rah go, and then and then the reality of the property's open, it's operating. It, you know, how do we make it do what we want it to do? Requires work and requires incorporation of partners and different things that. Um, and then there's the others that are saying, eh, you know, I'll wait and see, I'll wait and see. And then, and then they end up saying, oh, geez, I missed my opportunity. I should have jumped in there earlier. And so I think it's really managing per perceptions and, and, and creating a, a realistic uh, perception for each person that you talk to and bring into the, in, into the concept. How many uh, franchisees do we have now? And how many properties do we have? So we're at a, a hundred and 15 franchises right now um that stacks up to about 40 franchisees 45 franchisees somewhere in there um there's 70 properties in operations today there's 10 tangibly under construction there's another 16 that'll break ground in 2024 as we know it right now so the, that's the, great we've we've really uh you know there was a couple of slow years there in 21 and 22 with new development starts that uh that that pile up has now uh, spun up again. So it's been all, busy. all in South Dakota. Yeah. All in South Dakota. We're, uh, we're 36 States right now. Um, you know, through the Midwest, the Southeast, Southwest Pacific, Northwest, not, uh, not a huge saturation in the, in the far Northeast, but our first couple of properties are going in and, in, in, uh, in those States right now. Well, what's the, there you go. What's the easiest part of the country to, to develop the or franchise in and what's the hardest? Boy, that's changed a lot in the last couple of years too. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say, you know, the Midwest is pretty simple. You find a lot of you find a lot of secondary and tertiary markets and and a little bit more navigable business climate. Uh, but we've had we've had really good success in the Southwest as well. I'd say the Pacific Northwest is a challenging area of the country to deal with. There's there's a lot more a lot more population density. There's you know climate challenges and and socioeconomic challenges that come along with a lot of those places, but also very rewarding places to be done well there. I mean, I, listen, it's, I'm going to tip my hat because franchising is just to me seems impossible and it takes so much more money than anyone thinks to create a brand to do the franchise. And I'm at, at the risk of talking like La Quinta, right? Butoff did a phenomenal job uh, and he still only had, you know, a, whatever, uh, but even country Inn and suites, which is backed by Carlson had a huge company behind him, did amazing. And then fizzled. Wingate was incredible. And then fizzled. Uh, mm -hmm. Even some of the big guys doing big brides, geez, God, yeah, even uh, how many have they done? Right. Um, so it's really hard, really hard to do a brand. So you're at over 100. That's as just little old us, if I may be so complimentary. Uh, that's pretty that's pretty impressive. Uh, what are your thoughts on all the new brands? They're all now jumping into your space. I don't know if that's a compliment that you guys, they finally caught on to what you guys have been seeing. But, I don't know. Um, we're, we're doing what we're doing. And, and when you look at, when you look at programming for, for others, there's, there's nuance to each one. There's differences. Uh, I think we understand the extended stay business from a little different perspective. Um, and, and we're going about it in a different way. And so that's going to continue to separate us, but yeah, I, it's not easy. It's not easy to establish a brand and grow a brand, whether you're one of the major brands or you're little old us. It's it's challenging from all perspectives because it requires people, and and that's where it it you've got to be able to get close to the people and stay close to the people in order to to bring them along in in the fold of what you designed it to be. And I think that that's more challenging for the larger companies than it is for companies like us. And that makes me pretty confident in our ability to keep growing in it. All right. Tell me why, why should I build a, my place, be a, my place franchisee rather than see Marriott's is uh, uh well, Hilton's is live studio. Marriott is studio res. Hyatt just came out with theirs. IHG has been in it with Candlewood with choice ball, Wood Springs. All right. Why should, why should I do a my place suite? Well, I think I think we're sitting right in the middle, right? Because you've got you've got brands like Candlewood and Town Place and and the and the established uh extended stay brands from the from the larger parent companies that have been around for a while. There there's a lot of saturation out there. They're pretty well spread and and the opportunities are somewhat more limited for markets. You also have the new brands that are launching and again, whether you're Marriott or Hilton or 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 Wyndham, 
you've got a challenge ahead of you. And all of those brands have zero or one or two or three properties out there in operation. They're going to learn some things over the next 10 years. They're going to change some things over the next 10 years. We, on the other hand, we've been at this now for about 10 years. We've learned the lessons, we've established ourselves, and we're ready for the next group of people to come in and continue to grow with us. So I think we're sitting in a really good spot. We're kind of kind of uh, at the forefront of of the growth that happens in the cycle that's ahead of us. Uh, yeah, you've learned it, the mistakes. Uh, been there, done that. What's it going to cost me to build? What's the cost? Uh, today, you're looking at uh, 85, 90 before land and soft costs uh, okay. per, per room. So. Uh, we're typically building 64, 71, or or 85 unit properties. So that's that's our sweet spot. We've got three primary prototypes. When you go around the country today and look at the my places that you know, you may see a little difference on exterior finish, but once you walk inside the box, they're all exactly the same. The programming of it is is production oriented. It's designed for for comfort and and balancing guest experience and expectations of hey, I want to I want a reasonably priced place to stay with i want a very comfortable very clean feeling filling hotel to stay in and so um yeah that 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 number was a little bit better a few years ago before before the world almost ended and prices went up but uh we're pretty happy to be in the space that we're at right now have they come back down have they come back down a little bit we're hearing they're coming back down i'm not necessarily seeing any reductions but but an easing of the increases and maybe yeah. a stabilization is is a better way to characterize it from from our perspective yeah and you mentioned you're happy you're in this segment or why i believe you but why well i think i think the as you look at the different periods of downturn that we've had and the the most the the most quickly rebounding segments it's that middle it's that middle section right we're not we're not too high to the we're not too far to the top end and 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 we're not banking on you know long term stay you know relocations and and essentially people living in hotels we're uh, we're more balanced and the dynamics are focused on a balance of short and long term stays to give us a pretty reasonable average and, and you, uh, you don't want to be any higher or any lower in that food chain no i don't i i don't see the best opportunity being there i think the the working you know blue and gray collar traveler is really our bread and butter and they're the ones that remain the most stable because guys like you and I and pretty much everybody else out there needs those people always in motion the 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 traveling nurses and doctors and you know healthcare professionals and and military is it's a it's a lot of the business that all of the brands are doing at many levels but i think it's the most stable throughout all periods of the cycle in that seg in that section that we're in. All right. Give me your 2024 outlook. And then I want to finish talking about Ron. I think uh, 2024 looks like some continued stabilization. We're all getting used to kind of the the craziness that we've been living in. Um, you know, we keep on redefining what the new normal is. So I hope to see that. I think capital markets are a little bit more elastic than they have been in the last 24 months. And, and, uh, there's more to work with there. So I'm enthusiastic about it. It's really difficult to, to pinpoint um, forecast and demand in the hospitality industry today, just because it seems like booking windows have gotten shorter and and a, a real confidence in, in long-term outlook for American business uh, is challenging. So, you know, we're, we're thinking that we're thinking that uh, it's a, it's a, it's a maintenance and incremental growth year. And, and we're happy about that. You think 25 is better? I hope 25 is better, but I have some pretty right. good confidence that it will be. All right. That's what we want to hear. Um, all right. I want to talk about, this is great. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Uh, yeah. I want to add to talk about Ron, because uh, I know he passed away a few weeks ago, uh, who Ron Ribbit, uh, your grandfather, your your mentor, your father figure. Uh, tell us what a great man he was and uh, and the influence he really had on you. <laughs> it's, um, it, it, I've, done a lot of this over the last last month and uh, I used to be able to tell the story a lot because that's always been a big part of my story and our company story and everybody asks but I can tell you what it's, it's gotten more difficult today because it seems like when someone's gone it's a bigger obligation to be able to characterize them well and the most dynamic people are so difficult to characterize you look through you look through pictures and you look back at memories that you have and you go, how could I even explain to people how incredible this person that I shared a lot of my life with was? But 
tell you one thing that that stands out the most about about Ron is that he absolutely never stopped. I look at what he accomplished in early stages of his career, later stages of his career, and and you know the last ten years where he's kind of been just absolutely doing whatever he wanted to do. And the guy was always creating something. Um, you know, his ability to cast vision was absolutely uncanny. And, and you know, when he looked at things, whether it was a piece of farm ground, which he absolutely loved his farm, and, and we do a lot in farming here, uh, and said, you know, I'm going to move that over there, and next year I'm going to plant this here, and I'm going to kind of turn this around over here. And next thing you know... Uh, you look at it a couple of years later and you go, wow, this thing was, you know, it's like watching Vegas develop out of the sand. Right. And, and he did that with people too. And, and that was, um, that was something that, you know, like I said, to be able to cast vision and see the potential in something were qualities that undoubtedly changed a lot of people's lives, but were the most admirable about him. He was just always trying to figure out how to improve uh, what, what was around him. And, and it was a big part of, big part of what's made me who I am today. And, um, a big objective that I have is to learn how to get somewhere even remotely close to that by the time I'm 83. Yeah. What do you want to learn from him? What do you want? What do you want to leave? You've seen his legacy. What do you want yours to be? Um, you know, the, the focus on people is, is extremely important. And, and what I've thought about over the last 30 days or so is, is all of the relationships that I've found and and have been fostered by being in business. Uh, I think one of the most unintended consequences of franchising is that your franchisees become your friends. And, and the amount of time you spend and the reliance that you have on a lot of them, it's not obviously all of them, but you hit it off with certain people. And, and first of all, that's our business. That's hospitality. But when you get to that uh, that level of trust that has to exist between a franchisee and a franchisor, if you're doing it the right way, those friendships turn into something that that is really valuable for everybody. And and I I think looking at all of the people who have reached out or or showed up for for uh, you know memorial services and things, who have told stories and said you know, I was doing this or I didn't think I could do that. And, and Ron said, Hey, why don't you come along? I'll show you what, what we're going to do here. And you see if you can make it work. And today I'm, you know, really successful or, you know, all of my success could be attributed back to that one thing. And I want to have an impact in people that are close in the lives of people that are close to me in that way. Not, not to specifically do things for them, but to, but to engage with them and, and, and growing and, and, and developing something that we can look back at and say, yeah, that was, that was pretty fun. It's, uh, Ryan, thank you for coming on. This is fantastic. It's exactly what I wanted. Um, but the people, the reason we're doing this is personalizing our industry, right? But it's about the people and you just, whether it's your franchisees, which you just said so eloquently or your employees or your partners or your banker or you whomever, right? It's, if you really look at this, it's not about making money and, Oh, I got to make all this money. Uh, or even winning, whatever you have to define winning, enjoy right. the journey, enjoy the people you're going through it with. And then every day you get up, you're very happy. It's not work. All the cliches, I get it, but you're personalizing that. hundred percent. Well, he was a great example. Uh, your grandfather, Ron Rivet, started Super 8, one of the iconic brands in our industry, for better or for worse. Amazing, amazing life that he lived. Yeah. So now we all got to go do it too. No pressure, Ryan. No pressure. Right. No, no, no pressure at all. <laughs> uh, Ryan, this is fantastic. Uh, we're going to pull for you, your family, uh, your brand, your company, uh, my place. You're doing great things. How many did granddad have? Ron had 1,100. So you got 1,100. You got a few, 150. You got a little ways to go. A couple more years. A couple more years. We'll be there. You got it. Uh, we'll be watching. We'll be watching closely. But we've great. got confidence. You're going to get there. Awesome. Ryan, thank you so much for sitting down. This is great. Thanks, Teague. Appreciate it. Let's Bless do it again. to you and the family. Thanks.